If you don't right. service that business that you already have very well, there's no point in being on this hamster wheel and continuing to add to it when we're not going to take care of that base. Patty, I really enjoyed our interview today. It was kind of a part two with Elena Smith right? uh, talking about mistakes that ISOs make. We just talked a few weeks ago about um, some of the good habits. And today we talked about some of the bad habits, I guess you'd say, of, uh, of the ISOs, right? Great advice she offered. You know, some things that I hadn't even thought about until she brought them up. Yeah. So yeah, I think I... people are really going to get a lot out of this interview, especially anybody who's trying to grow their organization. Yeah, and then I kind of followed that up with uh, along the same line of you know scaling your ISO, and I asked the question to the CEO of the company, even if you're an individual, whoever the top person, are you trying to milk your organization or grow your organization? Both can actually be important, but um, mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit, um, and then tell us about the insiders. Ah, the insiders report is uh, you know some more regulatory action against uh, a payment processing company that was working with scammers. The yep. bottom line being, you need to vet your clients a lot, bit, lot more closely. I like it. Um, so uh, before we dive in today, uh, let me share my normal disclosure, which is that uh, in this case, Elena Smith, Secure Bank Card. Uh, actually, Secure Bank Card did a little bit of advertising with me about a year ago, um, but uh, never any consulting. They currently are not paying us for any services, and they're not in any way sponsoring uh, this episode or paying us for this interview. This is just a great interview with a thought leader in payments, and we're really looking forward to it. So let's dive in. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are here today with our good friend, Elena Smith. How are you doing today, Elena? I'm doing well. Thank you, James. It's Thanks so great to have you me. back. And Lane, I always enjoy our conversations. Always fun. Yes, for sure. So we actually did a podcast not too long ago where we talked about the habits of successful ISOs and some of this kind of positive side. And then Elena and I were talking as we do often on social media or maybe it was email this time. And we were saying, you know, well, what about mistakes? What are the common mistakes that ISOs make as they're, as they're trying to scale up? And so we're going to talk through some of that today. I really think it's going to be some valuable insights. Um, before we do that, Elena, for those who maybe missed the last episode, uh, maybe there's a few people in my audience that don't know who you are yet. I can't imagine. But in that case, um, give us the quick version of just who you are in the industry and, and what you do. Sure. Sure. We have a wholesale ISO secure bank card. Um, my husband and I started it about 12 years ago or so. Um, and we started it and did things a little differently. So instead of reselling um, processor services. We wanted to minimize what the processes were doing for us. So they just authorizing clear transactions. We wanted to have a lot more control over the process. So we do all of our own merchant billing, our own merchant funding. Um, and we, we have control over that part of the process. And then, then we can share that control with the ISOs and the agents that we serve. Um, and I just, uh, I only got into payments with the start of that business. And I've just really enjoyed it. I've taken to LinkedIn to talk a lot about what I've learned and share that with others and start conversations about it. Um, so I think that's the way you and I connected. Um, yep. And I just haven't stopped talking about it. So <laughs> that's what I love to do. You can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, and it's really great. It's really great because you are new to the industry. You know, I mean, you have this financial background. You understand finances, but you came into this industry with like a fresh look, and that's what I really appreciate about the content that you put out there. It's not from somebody who's been doing the same thing for 30 years. It's somebody who came in fresh and said, hey, you know what? Here's something you might want to try. So I really appreciate that. I do think we get caught up in our old ways a little mm -hmm. bit in payments. And now I notice myself that happening with me, you know, the longer I'm doing this, you kind you just, you accept the way that things are done when you've been doing them for so long. So it is nice to have new perspectives come in and give a fresh take. So we've done some hiring of outside, you know, people with no payments experience to just come in and give it a fresh look because we're always open to change. Yeah. And how do we do things a little differently than we did yesterday? If there's a better way of doing it, let's do it better. Why not? Yeah. yeah and I think, right. I think, um, yeah, I, I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago on one of our uh, company meetings, I told everybody, I said, you know, when, as we're hiring new people, if they ask a question of like, well, why do you do it that way? Saying that's how we've always done it is not an acceptable answer. That's the no. wrong answer. <laughs> wrong <laughs> answer. Yeah, that should make you think, why are we doing it that way? Right. And then let's talk about that. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so and the other thing I do want to point out here though, Elena, is with your position in the industry and, and, you know, we say new to payments and it's like a decade, you know, like in our industry, but like, still that's, that's new, newer, new newer, newer, right. <laughs> but but the idea is um, because, you know, you have this wholesale um, processor that's then working with ISOs, you get to see a lot of ISOs and kind of you get to see these mistakes they make, which is why I think this is going to be such an interesting conversation. So so let's let's start, you know, 
let's start before the beginning a little bit here, right? So, so the idea is, you know, agents and ISOs, a lot of times I talk to them and they're like, wow, I really want to build a payments business. I'm tired of like just being me, I'm out selling, or maybe I've got a couple of sub agents, but like, I think I'm ready to do something. I'm ready to build an ISO. Um, and oftentimes they can get focused on that and like, okay, let's go. Let's just grow this thing. Let's make it happen. What are some of the mistakes that you see these individuals and companies making where they're not really establishing that foundation? Like what are the mistakes that you see really early on? I think there are a couple of things. The first thing is that because we're talking about sales professionals and organizations, they get so caught up in sales and bringing new sales and adding new merchants that they don't think about as much as taking care of the business that they already have. If you don't right. service that business that you already have very well, there's no point in being on this hamster wheel and continuing to add to it when we're not going to take care of that base. Um, the other thing is because they can be so sales minded, they really neglect the operational side of it. And I think in the beginning, if you can do this in the very beginning, it's so important and it'll really help as you scale. I think if you can define those operational processes in the very beginning and lay all that out as a good foundation, you define those key activities of how are you spending your time and what do those different activities look like, build processes around those activities, and then automate as much of that process that you can. I think we see in boarding so much, a lot of rekeying of data, that's where errors happen. Uh, and that's just not a great merchant experience when we, you know, board someone and we've got something in there incorrectly and it causes a bad situation for a merchant early on. So Elena, I thought, you know, as I was typing up these questions and this one in particular about, you know, what happens before they grow, one of the other things I was curious to get your thoughts on, um, I was thinking about my own experience and, you know, when I had probably about 50 mids, you know, just individual agent, I'm out selling and I got like 50 mids and, um, one of the interesting things that people run into at that stage is this whole cash flow thing as well. You know, it's like, I don't have enough money. Like, how do I hire people? How do I, you know, I need to grow, but I don't have enough money. And I started asking myself an interesting question back then, which was, okay, I'm really, I was taking care of my merchants, you know, like I was really, that was a big deal to me. It was my reputation. It was all in the local community. So I really cared about that. And I started asking myself, is there anything else I could do for these business owners related to payments that they would appreciate. Now this is back, this is probably, you know, uh, 11, 12 years ago, but it, it was so easy at that point to make money. I think a lot of the agents missed the idea that like, yeah, it was really hard to sell this person, but now you've been giving them great service for a year. And a lot of times they skip over opportunities that, you know, yeah, you didn't sell them on the $12,000 point of sale set up for their five location restaurant initially because they didn't trust you. Now they do. Go now back. you have that relationship. Yeah. Like have you have right. you seen that where it's kind of like fostering the relationship, not just for, you know, retention, but also for like for revenue. You're making a hundred dollars a month on the account, but they would actually be willing to pay you five thousand dollars to help you know, them implement a new system or whatever. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that from kind of more of the financial. Absolutely. Side yeah, I do I do agree with that. And as long as it's still related to payments, I think sometimes mm -hmm. we try to push too far outside of payments yeah, and point. then that ends up being a distraction. But absolutely, if you can add on value to that existing relationship and leverage that trust that you've already established with them. Why not? Um, right. Because they, uh, if you're solving a problem for them, do it. They'll accept it all day long. Right, um, yeah. You're helping them out at the end of the day. And sometimes I think we are too afraid to ask for that additional sale. We just kind of just don't want to rock the boat. That's sort of like it reminds me, James, when I first met you. One of the things you were doing, you would discuss, was uh, doing QuickBooks uh, implementation for merchants. That to yeah, me that, sounds like that, that would definitely be I was pushing then. it a little, James. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That well, you know, it's like well, it's interesting, Elena, and I'm, this would be something you would obviously relate to as well, you know, with your finance background. But I think it, what's interesting is, um, I think the key is you have to actually be an expert at the thing that you're trying to help the business owner with. Right? Exactly. They're willing to pay for it, right? So, like, you know, I would go in and say, um, you know, hey, I can help you figure out. Like, a lot of times it was reconciliation. That was that was the connecting dots. It was that right. you know they're trying sure. to reconcile their QuickBooks with their point of sale or whatever, right? Um, but you know, you like, well, I took the time to get QuickBooks certified. You know what I mean? And so, like, you have to actually be the expert at the thing, or like the point of sale system. I talk to agents so often where their customers are having this negative experience, and they're like, oh, the point of sale company. And I'm like, well, do you know anything about the point of sale system? Like. No. Well, why don't you take a day and learn this point of sale system that you're selling everybody? And they're, they'll have accounts, Elena, they're making $1,000 a month in residual on the account. Right. And it's like, they don't even know how to make a modifier 
on the wow. menu. And it's like, <laughs> um, hello, like, you know, you could, and, and I mean, a lot of times you can go to these merchants and say for a thousand dollars for $5,000, I'll help you X, Y, and Z with this point of sale. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but anyway, a little off the beaten path. I just was thinking about that as kind of the, as you're growing, you know, to be able to provide that great service as a way to even make additional revenue and, and, you know, get new opportunities. Absolutely. So, okay. So, um, once they check these boxes, they have this solid foundation, like we just discussed, and then they're like, okay, now I'm ready to grow. A lot of times they think I need a new upstream partner, or at least they want to explore that. What are the mistakes that you see in that process early on when they're kind of like trying to identify who should I go with and who should I build my ISO with? Uh, there are a few different things here. Well, there's there's several, but I'll try to just narrow it down and focus on the big ones. Um, one of the big ones that we see is they commit to a deal with a minimum in it and they don't mm. bother to do the math. Yeah. They don't ask the question of exactly how much business do I need? For this minimum to, you know, for me to meet the minimum in the first place, mm -hmm. what's included in the minimum, because a lot of the fees sometimes like interchange and assessments are usually not included in the minimum. It's the other kinds of fees that they count against the minimum. So take time to understand what gets counted as part of the minimum. Um, how long will it take you to scale up to that minimum? Um, you've got to do the math to understand what that minimum involves. If it's a good deal, it's not a good deal if you don't meet the minimum and you're just paying the minimum and you, you're not even close. It right. kind of undoes that math for you. So just take the time to calculate that. If you can't do it, find somebody who can help you do that because in the end, it just usually isn't worth it. And you know, there are Lena, deals. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like, let's for one second. For there may be a lot of people listening who actually don't even know what that means because they have okay. not had that that exact thing. Can you actually explain that a little bit more? Of like, okay, I'm a I'm an individual agent or small ISO, and I'm going to go negotiate directly with one of these big companies, and they say, oh, we're going to give you this incredible deal, and this is your minimum. What does that mean? So it means the minimum amount of business that you have to do with them or the minimum fees that they're going to bill to you. So they might give you six months, for example, to ramp up to boarding a certain amount of business. Um, and they have to bill you a minimum of fees by that six month period. By if the you end don't of that get six to that months. place, what's that? By the end of that, at the end of that, yes, you have six at the months end of that, six ramp months. up, right? Is what you're yes, saying. Yes, one okay. shoot. And sometimes they are, sometimes it's a ramp up. Um, it depends on the deal, but usually it's some kind of timeline. And they'll tell you, you need to be billing or we need to be billing you a minimum of, I don't know, $10,000 in fees. So that usually doesn't mean a minimum of merchants that are, you know, billing merchant fees. That means you as an ISO or an agent are paying that in fees. So that's things like account on file, PCI compliance fees, authorization fees, fees those right. extra kind of fees. Mm -hmm. So just yep. take the time to read the verbiage yep. and understand what that minimum means and, do and the how math. you would expect to meet it. Because right. if you've, I've, I've just talked to way too many people who find yep. themselves on the wrong side of a minimum mm -hmm. and they're stuck and they're paying it and it's very painful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so to clarify, cause I know I've had so many of these conversations as well, and it's very crazy is that what we're, what Elena is saying here is if you don't hit that minimum, and I mean, usually it's, usually it's a lot like a hundred thousand dollars, $200,000. Mm -hmm. And if you're only building out say 70,000, then you owe 30, <laughs> you exactly. know, like it's a lot and you have There's to pay your that, profit so. margin. So Plus. be very careful on that. It's that, the quickest that, that, way yeah. to go out of business. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've seen too many, I've seen yes. it happen too many times and it's yeah. just not worth the the savings that a deal with a minimum can bring. If you're not confident that you can hit yeah. it. 100%. Yeah. Um, another thing I would say is that agreement, get a legal resource that specializes in payments and and invest in having them review that agreement so that you know exactly what you're getting into in that agreement yeah. so that you understand that it aligns with your business goals. I know none of us really like to pay legal fees, um, but this is one investment that will pay for itself at least 10 times over, I would say. And I don't, yes. I don't know anyone who's been around um, for more than a year that wouldn't agree with that. Uh, also, they don't check references ask other people who are submitting business to this entity and ask them, what is their experience like? And the closer that you can get to somebody who's submitting the kind of business that you're going to be submitting to them, the better so that they might have a similar experience to what you can expect as well. Um, and just ask how it's going, what kind of challenges they've come up against. Um, ask them to give you some real examples of what their experience has been like working with this provider. They also don't take time to vet the relationship 
to make sure that they are going to fit their specific needs. So does this organization offer the product or the gateways that they want to deploy? Is it on the processor that they want to be on? Uh, if you want to do pin debit, do they offer pin debit? If you need next day funding, do they have, if you're you know working for restaurants, they're very conscious of when they get their funding. Do they have the timely funding that you have to be able to deliver? So you need to ask all those questions. What are your requirements? And make sure that they meet all of those requirements. I, I love it. And Elena, I, I want to add one thing to this. I, I think you will agree with one, one of my personal pet peeves in this area and a huge mistake is this idea like if it's not in the agreement, then it does not exist. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, how many times I've talked to an agent that said, you know, it's like, well, you know, I actually have a pretty good deal because they said, and I'm like, stop right there. <laughs> okay. Number one, they're going to sell the business in the next five years, almost mm -hmm. guaranteed in this industry. So you're not trying to figure out what they would promise you. You're trying to figure out what would the purchaser of this processing company be legally obligated to do for you in the event of an acquisition? That's a great point. That's the really only thing point. that matters. The fact that you really like Susan and Susan has told you that she's going to make sure you're taken care of <laughs> means absolutely nothing. Because when right. Susan gets fired after the next company buys them out and they clean out the staff, dramatically reduce the service experience, and you know that company, that the, the private equity firm that bought them is not going to care what Susan told you she was going to do to take care of you. They're going right. to do what is in the contract, and that is all they're going to do. So I just That's a great point. There. <laughs> That's a really, really good point, James. So, so okay. go ahead. Go ahead, Patty. Yeah, I'm just wondering, okay, you know, we've talked about sort of how you set up the relationship, how you look at the relationship. Well, let's say, you know, you've you've got the relationship going with a new partner and, you know, you're ready to start boarding deals. I suspect there are some, some mistakes in that process as well. And wondering what some of the mistakes you see them making that can damage this relationship right out of the gate. Yes, I think that this relationship is very much about trust and you can either do things to promote that trust with each other. And it's two sided. It's not just you trusting us, it's me trusting you and that you're, you know, disclosing everything that you should disclose in an yeah, application like, and that kind of thing. It goes both ways. And and, and being, tr I mean, disclosure on both sides. I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what you mean by trust. <laughs> yes, exactly. So in, of course, underwriting is the first part of that process. And mm -hmm. it, this is so interesting to me because we see so many interesting things come into underwriting and especially in new relationships. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like we get these new relationships and they, they're they trying to test us out a little bit. You know, they're not, sure. they don't really want to take the biggest and best deal that they have in the pipeline, which I get that. I completely understand we're unknown to you. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, they want to like do something maybe little or or something that they don't care if they lose. But what they do a lot is they give us something that's on match. They've probably submitted it to other relationships and it was declined. And then they send it to us, which that's my first impression of you. That's not a favorable not a impression. first impression. Yeah. They give us something that's identity theft, which again, they've probably submitted it elsewhere. We look at the credit report and there's five credit inquiries from other payment processors on it because somebody's shopping a stolen identity merchant. Um, it's factoring. <laughs> they give us something that's factoring and then they get upset with us that, you know, maybe it's not great that we do business together. You're right. right? We don't do this kind of business. We, we're not the right home for you. Uh, it just, they, or they give us something very high risk before I can know that. How do you vet your high risk? How do you handle high risk? What is your process for managing these kinds of merchants? Maybe just start with something a little on the smaller and safer side, because we're trying to get to know you as much as you're trying to get to know us. So just, right. you know, try to keep it something pretty easy going at the outset. Um, also in, in underwriting, I would just say it's always better to disclose what you know in underwriting. Uh, if you don't, we wonder whether you maybe haven't done your, you know, collected enough information to actually know what you're under or what you're submitting to underwriting in the first place, mm -hmm. or you might have intentionally left something out, hoping to kind of slide one slide under through. the radar. Right. Neither of those is going to do anything to help us build trust with each other. So let me ask you though, I mean, because you know, I know that we're kind of focusing on the negative in this in this interview today, but I mean. In terms of new relationships, um, 
do you see them more likely to be problematic or more likely to be, you know, your experience that more of them are, you know, bringing the mom and pop store? In yeah, just most to sort of them, of most of them are really great people to work with. Honestly, okay. these are the exceptions. Right, right. Um, and I honestly think that a lot of people do it because they just don't think about the perception they're giving when they do stuff like this. I mm -hmm. honestly think, like I said, they're trying to test us out sure, and they don't want to lose something, you know, that might be significant to them. So they're, well, this is disposable anyway. I don't know that I can put it up anywhere at, a, anyway. So mm -hmm. that's why they do it. But I just don't, I don't think they take the time to understand that that's probably not the best initial impression with us. But sure. I would say 95% of the new business that we get is, you know, on the up and up and a pleasure to work with and not an issue. Well, I think, I think too, you know, Elena, to me, a lot of it is this lack of patience, right. Around the value of the reputation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in this industry, uh, I can't tell you how many times I'll, I'll talk to an agent and they'll, you know, their block of getting a deal done is something that I would consider trivial, you know, well, I really need this exception made and it's a reasonable exception, or I really need this equipment for free. I need to borrow against my residuals to place this $10,000 worth of equipment to get this huge account or, you know, or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, that their, that their upstream partner is going to have as part of their traditional program, but it seems like a very reasonable thing. And yet they can't get it because they have a bad reputation with that company and the company just doesn't trust them. And they don't understand that if they actually built these great relationships and had this fantastic reputation as this solid producer with one company and with, you know, or even a couple, but it's like, you've got to have these relationships. That's like currency in this industry because yes. when you have those relationships, you, you can get stuff done. And when you don't have these relationships, you just can't get anything done. I don't know. That's, Absolutely. it seems like that's reputation really is everything and you yeah. have to fight like heck to protect that every day. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that that reminds me, you know, in terms of, you know, you're ongoing, right? You, you, you're you growing your portfolio, you, you're gaining traction. What are, what are some of the, you know, the goof ups, you know, what are, what are, what are they, what are some agents and ISAs doing wrong in terms of uh, choosing partnerships and merchants um, that weaken their long-term um, growth? I think a lot of times I see them settling for bad relationships and that's whether it's with a provider or a merchant, they feel stuck. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm really all about surround yourself by people that work at the same level that you do. Mm -hmm. If you're working up here, you want to be surrounded by people who work up there also, or you're going to be super frustrated. Mm. Um, if you work with a provider who's consistently missing merchant funding um, they have outages. It doesn't matter how strong your relationship is with your merchants. You can't recover from that. You no. can't, you know, maybe here and there um, that's, it happens and it happens to all of us. It's not, you know, sure. we, we all have our little weak links and they break every now and then, but if it's something that's happening consistently and they don't communicate about it, well, that's very damaging. If you're working with a merchant who's never happy, that is a huge drain and it's just usually not worth it. It takes so much energy away and it's a distraction. And I, I think too many times we are so much about building. We don't want to take away from what we've built mm -hmm. that we're not, we're too afraid to say, I can't, I'm not the right one for you and send right. them on their way. And I think we need to do that if it doesn't feel like the right fit for each other. Almost like you're saying almost, you know, fire the client yes don't be afraid to fire clients some of them need yeah. to be fired right, right. <laughs> unfortunately yeah. most of them do not but there are right. some that do sure yeah. yeah and you know what's interesting to me is when you go to a client that you're kind of on the fence you know and maybe they're maybe they're treating you in an unprofessional way or maybe they're making unrealistic demands and when you go to them and you make it very obvious that while you completely respect them and appreciate their business you're fine to let the business go um, almost without exception, at least in my case, those merchants have stayed with me and become great merchants. When I go back to them and say, Hey, you want a, B and C. I completely respect that. You want that. I cannot do C. I can do a and B. Now, if that means you need to find another provider, let's part mm -hmm. ways right now with no hard feelings. So what would you like me to do? Almost without exception. Oh, C is not that big of a deal. If you can do a and B, we're fine with that. Okay. As long as you're good. I just don't 
I don't want to get another phone call from you that says you got to have C because I'm telling you right now, I cannot do that. Right. So are you okay moving because forward? Because you're that, being you know? honest with them yeah. and that's and pretty that. uncommon. Of course. Yep. And you've yeah. set boundaries with them and that's healthy. We need to set boundaries with each other and say, I can do this. I can't do that. So right. I think that's appreciated when you can have honest conversations yeah. like that. It's, you know, it's so much to me. It's all, it's like friendships, right? I mean, you have to have honest conversations with your friends or they're not going to be your friend. You have to have <laughs> honest conversations with your clients or they're not going to be your clients. And in a way, it seems to me, and I've seen, you know, I, I've known a lot of agents over the years, and the more successful ones that I've known have treated their clients like they're their friends. Yeah, yeah, they build those real relationships for sure. So, so Elena, now let's talk about those in our audience who are larger. So they've built up a good size ISO. They've they've caught their stride as far as distribution. They're doing their 30, 40, 50 deals a month, you know, and, and they're they're moving, they're growing. What are the mistakes you see that they make at that level where, you know, it kind of maybe even below the surface a little bit where it's like long term, it's slowing them down, but they don't realize that and they're making these mistakes at that level. What are your thoughts there? I think that they, if they have processes, they don't take the time to revisit them. Maybe they're, you know, the the leadership in that ISO now doesn't take time to really get down into the weeds um, to understand how well those processes are working and understand if there are any bottlenecks that they need to revisit. One of my favorite things to do is actually go into our support queue and work tickets and see how, how well that process is working and see, you know, mm-hmm. Is this as automated as I think that we've designed it to be? Is the process working the way we designed it to work? Um, and I think sometimes you just have to roll up your sleeves to actually go in and do it yourself to see that. Don't feel like you're too, you know, beyond working in the weeds to do the dirty work, basically. Um, and just constantly check in on that. Um, the other thing I think is that we need to carve out time for continuous learning. And if we don't do that mm. and we operate in a vacuum, um, things are changing too quickly around us and it's going to pass you by. If you don't adopt some of these changes that are happening Mm -hmm. and incorporate them into your business, then you're going to be worse for it. Eventually it's going to catch up with you. The payments industry uh, preaching to the choir here, but it is ever changing daily. So it's really important for us to sharpen our saws and keep learning about what the changes are and what's coming next and how we might improve ourselves a little bit more to adopt any of those changes that make sense for us. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So um, Elena, it is always such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I always enjoy our Thank conversations. You. Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, I enjoy your LinkedIn as well. For those that don't, uh, you know, maybe aren't following you on LinkedIn, obviously look up Elena Smith. Um, but uh, give us a little insight on Secure Bank Card. What types of partnerships are you looking for? And uh, where should our audience go if they want to learn more about Secure Bank Card and what you're doing? Sure. We mostly work with ISOs and veteran agents. Um, we don't provide training or anything like that. It's for uh, people who have been in the industry for quite a while. And they're looking for quick onboarding, automation, um, you know, bar turnarounds very quickly, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, if you want to learn more, go to our website, securebankcard.com or uh, re- find me on LinkedIn. Always happy to have a conversation on LinkedIn. So message me there. And thank awesome. you again for having me, James and Patty. Oh, thank you for being here. This episode is sponsored by ISO Amp. Obviously, this is a company that's near and dear to my heart, Patty, since I of course. built the company from scratch. Uh, yes. Even did the first round of coding myself, which fortunately has now all been replaced uh, by real programmers, but uh, very proud of it. It is the leader in full service statement analysis. So if you and or your team is still spending time analyzing statements, getting data from from statements into spreadsheets, manually creating proposals, any of those types of things, please stop doing that. All you have to do is head over to getisoamp.com, G-E-T-I-S-O-A-M-P.com. Click on the request a free demo and my team would love to show you what we have. So Patty, today I want to answer a question of should I milk it or should I grow it? All right. Uh-huh. So uh, I was thinking about this because I've had uh, quite a few conversations with different consulting clients and ISOs and agents and stuff recently where um, I feel like a lot of times the CEO of the company or the individual agent or, you know, the person at the top of the organization, it could be an organization of one, but, you know, the person at the right. top is getting unnecessarily focused on milking what they have created mm-hmm. rather than on growing uh, 
uh, something greater, right? Yeah. And I wanted to just present a very interesting uh, rule that I've had for myself that I think has worked very well for me over the years. Um, and I want to explain it, but I'm going to give you the rule first and then I'll explain it because it's a okay. little, you know, may, people may not understand what I mean by it. So I only grow my business. I hire people to milk my business. Uh -huh. So let me explain what I mean by that. Sure. Let's say that you are leading an ISO and you are doing 15 to 20 deals a month. You have maybe three or four sub agents and you know, you're off to the races. You're doing really, really well. Well, you might ask yourself a very reasonable question, which is, am I getting the best deal from my current partner? Right. Mm -hmm. Should mm -hmm. I consider moving to a different partner? Um, should I renegotiate, you know, whatever. Right. Well, now, if you look at it and you say, wow, there's an opportunity to increase our profits by 40% if we renegotiate this, then of course that's worth your time. And that's about growth because now you're growing, right? What you have. But if you're like, oh, wow, we have a three basis point cost. I wish we could get it to two, right? Um, that is not worth your time. No. And and you say, well, it's not worth, if I, I wouldn't hire somebody to handle that, then what are you doing handling it? Mm -hmm. Just keep growing. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you will get big enough that these things that you could do to slightly decrease expenses or slightly optimize revenues or slightly increase efficiencies, eventually, as you get large enough, it will make sense for you to hire someone else to come in as an operating person or something like that to handle a lot of those issues. Now, does that mean you don't pay attention to them at all? No, no, not yeah. of course not. You're going to have your regular meetings with this individual and they're going to brief you on what's happening with this situation. Um, you know, uh, I could give you a, a, a interesting example of this. So recently, I think if I can say all of this here and uh, not violate non-disclosure agreements I have, I think I can. Okay. So there's an interesting story. So uh, we, I own ISOAMP, right? Which is like the largest full service statement analysis company in the world. And uh, we also have a payment processing account right? With a processor that shall remain nameless. Mm -hmm. And we process payments for consulting clients and for hundreds and hundreds of ISOs that do our training or whatever, right? So we right. do a lot of payment processing, right? Sure. Well, you would of course assume that our payment processing statement is like a thing of beauty. You know what I mean? We have like the best deal ever, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. Um, No, we don't. Well, we didn't. You know why? Right. Because I don't care about stuff like that. I just don't. I've been too busy growing the business. Meanwhile, <laughs> my processing partner was doing regular price increases on me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the other day when I looked at our profit and loss report and I saw like the merchant services fee line and I'm like, okay, wait a second here. I know enough to know that something's not right here. <clears throat> now, fortunately for me, I have people on my team that are fantastic at this, right? right, right. And so I just emailed one of them and said, hey, I am confident you're going to find a way to lower these expenses. Good luck. <laughs> you know, now I then asked, Hey, let's follow up on a regular basis. And so, and she literally right before this, just sent me a ping. Hey, we're almost done with the rate review. Here's where we're at. We're talking about interchange optimization and making sure that's all happening through the gateway correctly. And, you know, but it's like, I'm not, it's like, well, okay. Yeah. I could have saved a few thousand dollars there. Right. That's not worth my time. Right. And, and so, but as you grow the business, it gets to a point where you're like, well, wait a minute, that's a few thousand dollars. Like one of my team members could spend a couple of days on this. It would totally be worth it. Right. Right. Sure. And so focus on growing your business because you can either spend your time dealing with the fallout that happens from not growing. Right. All these challenges because you don't have enough money. You don't have mm -hmm. enough accounts. People don't want to work with you. Why? Because you're not growing. And you're not expanding. And so you could just focus all your time on, wow, this business really sucks because we're not growing. I need to like spend more time focused on the business over here and cleaning up this mess. Or you could focus on growing and then Let that's going to solve the mess. Yeah, it's going to solve all your problems anyway, because as you grow, you're going to make more money. You can hire people, you know, you can, you know, you can get different technology solutions and different software and you can solve these problems another way. So anyway, all that to say, if you are at the top of an organization and you're looking at your organization, ask yourself a question. Am I, how much of my time am I spending growing and building out into like expanding or how much time am I spending trying to milk what I already have and see if I can squeeze that last extra penny out of this process and this last little bit of efficiency out of this, um, or 
do I have team members that are doing that? And of course you're engaged in that process. Of course, you're aware of the details. Of course, you're living in the weeds as, as Elena said, um, but you're spending the bulk of your time growing and you're letting your team members handle the milking of the business, if you will. Which is why you created the team. So good advice. Exactly. Well, James, um, it's been my experience that uh, regulatory uh, actions involving payments companies are pretty rare. Yes. So it's worth noting that the Federal Trade Commission is at it again. Um, I reported uh, recently about how the Federal Trade Commission had gone after one of these um, uh, chargeback companies, you know, chargeback. Yep. Uh, chargeback 911, I think, right? Right. Um, this week's news is that the FTC has secured a judgment against a payments company that played fast and loose by boarding scammers. Okay. Wow. All right. Okay, so the company's called Nextway. It's a okay. multinational payments company. It's on the hook for about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The problem is, is it was the the damages, what it stole from consumer, you know, what it helped scammers steal from consumers, was closer to fifty million dollars. Wow. But the uh, government let the rest of it go because Nextway said it didn't have enough money to pay it all off. Right. Yeah. So now here's what happened. Next way, it's subsidiaries and two officers, according to a complaint filed in U.S. District Court by the Justice Department on behalf of the H uh, FTC. Um, they were in the, at the center of several offshore tech support scams that mid, you know netted millions of dollars for bogus computer repairs. Huh. And I have to say, before I go into this, I think I was one of those people. Um, I related here once before, and I know I explained to you, yep. James, yep. how I got scammed on a computer repair thing. Right. And and, a, and this typical scam seems to be very close to what I went through. Telemarketers use pop-up ads to hoodwink consumers into thinking the consumers were infected with a virus. Another alternative is the screen might freeze up and display, display a phone number to call for help. Right. Either way, the calls went to a call center in India where the victims were con convinced to pay for repairs. Uh, the card payments for those repairs were then processed through networks, through the card networks by ne what, Nextway hmm. or one of its competitors. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Com and the complaint also alleged that Nextway engaged in credit card laundering by allowing these Indian tech support scammers to process payments through other merchant accounts. Mm, interesting not, not a good idea <laughs> no uh-uh so um next way apparently work with these businesses even though the company's principals knew or should have known the clients were scammers according to doj this is what doj said in its complaint well you know doj estimated transactions from these indian tech support scammers accounted for nearly a quarter of next way's business between 2016 and 2020 Wow. Hmm. Yeah. It's sometimes, uh, sometimes easy money doesn't turn out to be quite it's that not easy. so easy, you know? And yeah. um, this is something I thought was interesting. I did a little research. Tech support scams are, are a big drain on Americans' finances. Uh, the FBI um, has estimated that um, they have more than doubled um, in the past three years from 14,000 to over 32,000. The different people that got scammed, you mean? Right. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, and that's only what's being reported. I mean, like when right. I got scammed, you know, I reported it to the state consumer people, right? Right, but right. I but who, know, who knows if that data made it all the way to the... Exactly, you know, whatever. exactly. Right. And I actually met a woman on a plane not long ago who was with the Justice Department and worked on these pro kind of things. Yeah. And she told me, yeah, you know, we, we don't even get half complaints, you yeah. know, from people that are scammed. But anyway, these uh, most of these scammers are located in South Asia, primarily India, according to the FBI. Um, and the DOJ and FBI are working with law enforcement agencies in India to go after these scammers. Um, in fact, they were able to raid multiple call centers in India last year and arrest scammers. Hmm. So, you know, it's I'm sure there's others that popped up the next town over or whatever, the next village over. Right. But, you know, this is a really serious problem. 
And it just goes to show you need to be really careful about, um, you know, vetting your clients. Yep, absolutely. Wow, good stuff, Patty. Thanks for keeping us in the loop on that. Sure thing. Sure.